Revelation says that our names were written down in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world. And the idea here is that God the Father, and however you want to reconcile it in your mind, that's up to you, God chose us. The Son concurred. And that's exactly what would happen in this ancient wedding uh, ceremony process. And the Son and the Father would approach the Father and the Bride, and they would draw up a covenant and a marriage contract, and a dowry price would be paid. Because again, the father of bride is losing a servant. He had to be compensated for that. And Jesus Christ bought us. His blood was the dowry price. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. For you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your body. You're bought with a price, with the blood of, of the perfect Lamb of God. And what's amazing about this entire process is that once the contract was drawn up, this was a binding contract. If you wanted to break off this betrothal, you would then have to have a bill of divorcement made up. Even though the marriage had never been consummated, it was a legally binding contract. Thus, we get the story of Joseph thinking in his mind, I should put away Mary because she's not Chase. They were not married yet. This was a legal binding contract that was a covenant between man, woman, and God. And to celebrate this covenant and this dowry being paid, they would drink a glass of wine. And I want you to think of the communion. When Jesus Christ ate the last Passover meal, he transformed that into, the, into a communion. It was a transformation. He said, this is my body, which has been broken for you. And he said, this is my blood. And they drank a cup of wine, therefore solidifying this new covenant relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. We are now betrothed to him in a spiritual manner. It's an amazing thing to think about. Now, once this whole process was done, there was a celebration. But what's interesting, this, the father and the son would then depart. And usually, he wouldn't come back for about 10 to 12 months. During that 10 to 12 month period, does anybody know what he was doing? He would go back to his father's house, and he would add a room on to his father's house, a bridal chamber for him and his bride. And he would live with the father. And the family would grow bigger and bigger so that their wealth would grow bigger and bigger. Look at, to me to the handout, John 14, 1 through 4. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. King James says mansions. That's uh, two words can be utilized, but it really means a room. If it were not so, I would have told you that I go and prepare a place for you. And, I, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also, and you know the way where I am going. Once the groom would depart, the bride would consecrate herself. She would be in waiting in anticipation for 10 to 12 months. Now, she knew the imminency of the return of her bridegroom. She knew when 10 months were getting close, but it could be 10, it could be 12. No one knew the day or the hour when he would come back. And he would often come back at night in a very elaborate wedding procession. Hence this idea of having their lamps trimmed. Now we see that their lamps didn't have any oil in it. If you look back through the Old Testament, oil always representative an association with the Holy Spirit. When King David was anointed with oil, it said the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. So when you see oil, it's always the idea of the Holy Spirit. And we see with these ten virgins, some were wise and some were foolish. The foolish ones, we can only assume they weren't saved. Because Jesus says, I never knew you. But the other application is, is that the ones who did have the oil, the ones who were saved, what were they doing? They were waiting and watching in anticipation with excitement. Look at the handout once again. And look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 and 3. Look what Paul writes. He says, for I feel a divine jealousy for you. Isn't that interesting for Paul to have said that? Since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin 
to Christ. But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere, pure devotion to Christ. During this 10 months, it was extremely important for this bride to consecrate herself, to reserve herself, and to be ready for her bridegroom. If the groom would find that she had become unchaste, that was a very big ordeal. It's not like in our society where virginity is something to be made fun of. This was something that was demanded. And this is demanded of the church that we remain pure. Now, I skipped over a verse. verse. This is a good time to go back to it. Look at Hosea 5, 4, the third verse down. During the tribulation, there's going to be a harlot that's named. This harlot is the church that is pagan. It's not the true church. It's the church that the Antichrist will attach himself to, use, his pow- use the harlot's power to bring everybody under the delusion to worship him as God as he makes himself known in the temple, according to 2 Thessalonians, which is talking about the man of sin. And because they believe the lie, God says, I will send them a strong delusion to believe in this man of sin. That's the harlot church that will believe in him. Somehow the Antichrist will bring everybody under his control through this harlot church. But you know, there's another harlot, and that's Israel. Look at what Hosea 5.4 says. Their deeds do not permit them to return to their God. This is speaking of Israel. For the spirit of whoredom is within them, and they know not the Lord. Do you know, realize that God the Father always cherished Israel as his chosen people? These are my people, he said, and I have a covenant with them. But they rejected Christ. And long before that, they rejected God the Father, which led them into the 400 (laughs) silent years of the intertestamental period. Why? Because they chased after pagan gods. And that's what it means that they were in an attitude of whoredom. Right now, Israel is separated from God. And we have taken their place. But someday, you know what's going to be amazing in the millennial kingdom? God's going to restore Israel back to himself. And Israel will be brought in and will be one body in the millennial kingdom, serving the risen Savior. But, it, but until we get to that time, folks, we are in this betrothal period. Now, what's amazing is when the bridegroom would come back for the bride, it was on an unknown time and hour. The bride had to be ready and waiting. He would come, and then he would take her back to the bridal chamber, and what's interesting is that for seven days, they would have a celebration, and they would consummate the marriage during this seven-day celebration. What's that sound like to you? Isn't it amazing after we're taken off this earth that we're going to be in heaven with our bridegroom for seven years while God's wrath is poured out on this wicked world that rejects him? That's what we have to look forward to. We have a wedding day to look forward to. You know, and what we tend to do, and I am most guilty of this, is we focus on everybody outside of the wedding party, the wicked world, and we focus on that. And we tend to lose and sap our strength, our motivation, our joy that should be reserved for telling people about our future groom, Jesus Christ. That's where our energy should be going. But if you're like me, a problem solver, always looking around, critical, you tend to get sapped with energy. You know, and that's not what we're supposed to be doing. Let's go to Revelation. Revelation chapter 2. You'll have to turn there. This is a passage that I want us to see. By the way, before we read that, I want to go back to a few verses that I skipped over. You know, the idea of topology is this idea that everything, that many things in the Old Testament point to Jesus Christ in the New Testament. It's a wonderful study to see how there's allusions to Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And Paul knew this very well. Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. And of course, we know what the Passover feast was. You would kill a Passover. On one day between the hours of 3 and 5, and after 6 o'clock that night, you would eat that Passover lamb along with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And obviously the Passover lamb was spilled its blood in the escape from Egypt, the Exodus, and that blood was placed over the post and the lentil of the door so that they would skip 
escaped the death angel. And we have escaped sin because Christ redeemed us. Let's look at this and how Paul sees this to our salvation. 1 Corinthians 5, 6 through 8. It's the fourth verse down. He says, your boasting is not good. This is referring to the church in 1 Corinthians 5 that's making fun of the stepson having relations with the stepmother. And they're making fun of it. The church of Corinth had many problems, okay? And this was one of them. He said, your boasting is not good. He said, do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. You're really unleavened. Why? Because Christ paid for your sin. And what does he say that our response should be? He said, listen, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Jesus Christ died exactly at 3 p.m. on Passover, exactly when the national lamb was being sacrificed in that temple. Jesus waited until 3 o'clock to give up the ghost to fulfill that ceremony because he is the fulfillment. Go to the next verse right below that to see this idea of topology and how rich it is that Jesus Christ did not come to abolish the law but came to fulfill it. Not only the law, but the ceremonies and the sacrifices that pointed forward to his sacrifice. Colossians 2, 16 through 17. He says, therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink. This is Paul writing. Paul was Pharisees of all Pharisees. He knew the ceremonial laws to a T. Look what he writes. Don't let anybody question you about food or drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are only a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Jesus, meaning Jesus is the one who these ceremonies really were pointing to. Whether it was a Sabbath, whether it was a new moon to keep the calendar straight because they used a lunar calendar to celebrate the feast, all this was pointing towards Jesus Christ, every bit of it. And here we have this idea of Jesus even fulfilling the idea of a bride and a bridegroom. Let's keep on now. We're now in Revelation chapter 2, talking about what happens when you focus on the negative and the problems and the evil all around you instead of focusing on what our joy should be through Jesus Christ. And this is something I've been trying to work on for a year, to be honest with you. Um, uh, like I said, my head's on a... I'm always turning, looking for problems to solve, right? Point them out. Rant and rave. How many do it? Politics does it. Dave's raising his hand out there. He's not shy. <laughs> you know what? We're not the only ones. The church at Ephesus had the same problem. Revelation 2, 1 through 7. Let's read it. I, I truly believe that the church of Ephesus was a local church that literally existed, but I also believe that there's other applications of these letters. I think when we read these letters, we can apply them to us as individuals. We can apply it to our own local churches, and we can also apply this, I believe, prophetically. And I believe that the church at Ephesus truly represented the first hundred years of the church history. You know, in the first hundred years of the, of the history of our church was critical. Let's read it, and I'll explain. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works. And Jesus would always begin these letters with, I know your works. That's scary, isn't it? Jesus knows everything that you do. There's no secrets with him. I know your works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst bear them who are evil. The early church... The apostles, the prophets, the disciples of the apostles, they were on the lookout all the time for Judaizers and for other evil people creeping into the church to try to spoil. Satan was very busy. And that's why the Holy Spirit didn't mess around when he killed Ananias and Sapphira. Am I getting the names right? He didn't mess around with that because they lied about what they had sold and what they had given. Let's read on. 
And how thou canst bear them who are evil, and thou hast tried them who say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. There was only 12 apostle folks, and that was it. Those who had seen the risen Savior and directly got the commission from him. But some said they were apostles and they were not. And you have borne and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because you lost your first love. You know, the church at Ephesus got so focused on problems that they forgot about the good news of Jesus Christ. They, just, they, they dried up, and they had just become bitter and jaded. You know, that can happen to us. And when you're like that, you're not going to share the gospel or the good news with anybody. It's not going to happen. It can't. Does anybody know what I mean? Does anybody ever feel that way? Let's read on. Verse 5 says, Remember, therefore, from where thou art fallen. Remember. It kind of reminds me of what Jesus said to Paul when he petitioned him three times to take this thorn in the flesh that he had, this messenger of Satan that buffeted him. He said, My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. Remember from where you were fallen when I came to you and unblinded you and said, listen, you're persecuting me. I am the church. And that's when Paul just said, I can't believe it. He was revealed, it was revealed to him. And John here records what Jesus says, remember where thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. What's the first works of the early church? Sharing the gospel. Do the first works. Where else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy lampstand out of its place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. I'll end there. The Nicolaitans were a group of men. Nicole means to have power over authority. Latian means laity over the church. These men were trying to come in and not only were given a license to sin, and to live licentiously, but they were also trying to exhort power over the church outside of the authority of the apostles. These were a wicked group of men who later on did get a foothold in the church. And I am convinced that these were the men who started the papacy in the the Catholic church and plunged the church into the dark ages. I don't want this to be me, and I certainly don't think you want this to be you, to lose your first love, but I think many times we do because we live in a hypercharged world of politics. I find it amazing that people get more passionate about the Second Amendment and the Constitution of the United States written by fallible men than they have passion in God's Word written by the hand of God. And that's silly, but many Christians are like that. And I used to be one of them, I must admit. I remember one time I was 13 years old and of course, You know, around Christmas time, you'd go to the mall and they'd have all these craft stores set up. You could buy Christmas gifts for people. And I remember one time when the Western belt buckles were in style. Do you remember those big brass belt buckles? And they would paint things on them. (laughs) Dave's back there laughing. I remember buying one. It had a skeleton on it with a guy clenched a rifle in his hands. And it says, I will give up my gun when they pry it from my cold, dead fingers. And I thought that was the greatest belt buckle in the world. 13-year-old patriot, you know, I'm going to go into the Marine Corps. And, you know, the passion that we have for things sometimes totally outshines what our passion should be for God's Word and our future groom. Why is that? Why do we dry up over all these silly things that take our attention away from the groom? Why is that? Why do we have such passion for these things that are going to be burned up someday? I don't know. I think we're all prone to it. But you know, it reminds me of what God told Cain. And I think this is true for all of us. When Cain was downcast and the wheels were turning for his gift because it was rejected, because it was the works of his hands, God says, why are you downcast? And God says, listen, I know what you're thinking. He said, sin crouches at your door. He said, but you better master it. I think sin can crouch at all our doors at one time or another. And we can recognize it and master it, or we can let it go unfettered. But God tells us to master it. Bring it under our control. 
And we need to do that, I think, in this time that we live in. Let's go to John 21 now. I think this is an amazing passage. And it's one of those passages that if you truly don't understand just a little bit of Greek, you miss the entire point of this passage. And I, I'm pretty sure that everybody knows enough Greek to know what the three Greek words for love is, correct? Agape, love, unconditional, phileo, brotherly, eros, the intimate love between husband and wife. Keep that in mind as we read this passage. John 21, 15 through 17. This is after the resurrection of Christ. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me more than these? Remember what Peter had just done when he denied his Savior three times. Keep that in mind. Jesus asked, do you agape me more than these? Peter says, he saith unto him, yea, Lord, thou knowest that I phileo you. He saith unto him, feed my lambs. He said to him again the second time, son, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? He saith unto him, Yes, Lord, thou knowest that I phileo you. He said unto him, Feed my sheep. He said unto him the third time, Simon, son of Joah, lovest thou me? And this time Jesus takes it easy on Peter and says, Do you phileo me? Peter was grieved because he had said unto him the third time, Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, you know us all things, and you know that I phileo you. Jesus said unto him, then go feed my sheep. You know, isn't it interesting that Peter could not bring himself to say, God, I love you with all my heart and everything that I am. Unconditionally, there's nothing that I won't do for you. Do you think Peter was holding back because he was being sincere and genuine about who he was? I just denied my Lord and Savior three times in one instance of a trial. I couldn't even stick up for my Savior. I think Peter was being honest. And I think Jesus appreciated that. Jesus certainly wanted to hear the answer, agape love, unconditional, undying, I will do anything for you. But you know, many of us, I don't think we have that love for Jesus in us. It's hampered by the sin of this world and by what we focus on, what we covet. But you know what? We should get excited about the imminency of the return of Jesus Christ. And that should help quell all this negativity that's all around us. Because I do believe we are living in the last days that Paul talked about when he addressed Timothy. Maybe we'll get to that if we have time. Now, actually, we're right there in my notes. Let's turn there now to 2 Timothy. I know I'm, try I know I'm tying three completely distinct passages together, but I think they, they make a very good message for us. You know, I am certainly not a chicken little type person that says the sky is falling. I don't believe in predicting, and I'm not a Harold Camping type guy that sets dates. But you know, Paul wrote to Timothy here in 2 Timothy chapter 3. I've read this several times in Sunday school. I, this is one of my favorite passages because I believe it's the only passage where Paul gives us a clue of what the days and years leading up to the return of Jesus to catch his bride up into the air. And, and be not mistaken, folks, before the Lord sets his feet on this earth, he's going to appear in the clouds and he's taken his church away. It's two distinct things. The day of Christ is the wedding day for us and the day of the Lord is a day of judgment on this earth. The book of Joel confirms the day of the Lord several times. That's the day where God judges this earth. Look at this passage here now. 2 Timothy 3. Now, pastor said seven-ish. I joked earlier to someone. To me, seven-ish can mean 705, 715, 720, 759. <laughs> but I promise you I won't take you to 759. <laughs> No, seriously, let's read this. This is a great passage. Verse 1, this know also. Notice the language here. Know it, Paul says, that in the last days perilous or difficult times will come. 
Do you notice how the last two years on this earth things have become more difficult? Not a little difficult, significantly more difficult. That's only a taste of what things are going to look like when the seven seals begin to open up that's outlined in the book of Tribula in, in Revelation. Let's read on. Perilous times for, will come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves. Lovers of their own selves. Think about when a person will only love themselves and care about nothing else, what they're capable of doing. Think about that. It's not just they're vain and they're selfish. Love them own selves only. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Unthankful and unholy. We could expound on each one of these words for two hours. I won't belabor these points. Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. That's the one I want to talk about just for a second. All around our world, we're seeing violence erupt, more so than ever before. We see it with the school shootings. We see it amongst family members. We see it on the streets and, you know, instances of road rage. And these events are becoming more intense every day. Let's read on. False accusers, incontinent means to be uncontrolled, fierce despisers of those that are good. And that makes me think of something. We live in a world now where a lie is turned into the truth, and the truth into a lie. What is a male and what is a female? I don't know. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine a dignified politician, someone who's going to be sitting on the Supreme Court to say, I can't define a female? I don't know what that is. That can be heady, that can be high-minded. I don't know what that is, but it's a clue of where we're at. Traitors, heady, high-minded, love of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power of it. We see church after church, the Methodist church has just split. Half of it's going to go and sanction homosexuality. The other half says, no, we won't. The Boy Scouts have crumbled over the idea of letting girls into the Boy Scouts and treating them like boys, allowing homosexuals in. We see it slowly encroaching on the sphere of God in this idea of unholiness. Let's go over to chapter 4 now, 2 Timothy, as we begin to close. Do you see what we can be focusing on? A lot of evil to focus on. Keep your mind off this. Know it's there, but don't dwell on it. 2 Timothy 4, verse 3. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. That's the time we're entering in, into this world. Fables. It's a fable to say, I don't know what a male or a female is. That's a fable. That's insane. God's made that so crystal clear. How can you ever un deny it, right? What's the focus of you as the bride? What's your focus? I hope your focus is on this uncoming day, this unbelievable day, when Jesus Christ will appear in the clouds according to 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It never says he's going to set foot on this earth at that time. He's going to stay up there in the air and he's taking us with him. Why is he going to do that? Because we've already been judged. And we won't be here for any of this. And I want you to know, I, the, the return of... Jesus is eminent and growing more eminent every day. Are you ready for him? Will you focus on him as your groom? And if you do, what will that result in in your life? If you quit dwelling on the negative, like I've always done, and I'm working on it, believe me. I don't watch the news. I don't pay attention to too many politics. And I don't care anymore. <laughs> I don't. I will certainly vote and do my civic duty because I think it's a good work to uphold Christian moral principles. But whatever the chips may fall, you know what? It's one closer to the return of my 
bridegroom to catch me away. And I think we're there. We're close. <laughs> what will you do with this excitement? You know, if someone would rescue you from a burning building, the flames are all around you, all four walls, and you know you're going to die, and someone bursts through that wall, and it's a fireman with a hose who sprays you down with water, picks you up on his back and carries you out, what will you do? You will spread the good news to everybody you know. Look what this man did for me. That's how we should be talking about the bridegroom. Tom Palmer's here, and he's trying to get us revved up with evangelism, and I know it's hard because I don't think everybody has the gift of evangelism. It's not an impulse for all people, and I think we be, need to be okay with that. But at the same time, I think there's something different between an evangelist, someone who has this unbelievable impulse to share the gospel, and someone who wants to share the good news of what Jesus did for them. That's different. You can share the good news and be an evangelist that way without ever having this drive or maybe this gift by the Holy Spirit to be an evangelist by the grace of God. Just tell the good news. The good news. I was saved and my bridegroom's coming to get me someday. That's it. You got the gospel sewed up right there without all the theological requirements. I hope you do master the theological requirements of the Romans Road and all the things that are pointed out to us to help us really tailor and show that we know our scriptures well to someone who is not a believer. We should be a defender of the Bible in those areas. But if, you, if you're someone who just can't do that, then don't worry about it. Share the good news about your bridegroom. Let's bow our heads. Lord, we thank you, Lord, for what you've done, that you became our propitiation, took the wrath of God on you, Lord, redeemed us. You were our substitute, the just dying for the unjust, Lord. I pray that we'd wake up realizing, Lord, that every day that we are not our own, but we are bought with a price, and that we would love our neighbor as ourselves, love one another, focus on your son and what he did for us. Lord, I pray that you would put that spirit within us every morning as we wake. Lord, I thank you for this church. I thank you for protecting it and guiding it. And I pray that each and every believer here, Lord, would leave pondering on your words, and they are yours. Lord, help us to be excited about the bridegroom. Lord, I pray that you'd be with us now as we leave here today and just bless our week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.